Hi, this is Danny Bird, and I'm going to show you how I build my tracks. So yeah, like, you know, like often uh, uh, you see, you know, a lot of uh, producers, you know, I've done, done some lectures at music colleges and stuff, and um, one of the things is everyone can start tracks, but no one can finish them. And uh, I'm always, I, I was always guilty of that, and still am uh, to, to, some, to, to some degree, but there are some little things that I've like, um, been able to like call upon over the years, little arrangement techniques and stuff. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a little bit like about that. How you turn an idea from, you know, um, just you know a few seconds to an actual sort of four minute piece, minute piece finished piece of music. So, um, so this track, this track, this selector track um, started off with this horn sample, which was from my trusty future music CD from like 1994. Good play again. Lucky it wasn't from a competitor there, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so it started off with this horn sample. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's like, my, my, it was actually a friend of mine that brought me that this sample. And I, I, rem I remembered it from the, the future music CD many years ago. And so it was kind of like, how are we going to, take that sample and then make something of it, you know. Um, so, so the first thing that I did was um, obviously get that all in time and stuff. And then, um, you know, I think it's like, I mean, a lot of my tracks, I mean, I mean some producers, they'll start off with the drums and then they'll um, work on the bait like you know do a bass line and then and then the intro is almost sort of incidental sounds leading up to that i can't work like that and i always have to have like a a sample or something to grab onto and the bass like i i always i find it much easier to write the bass line when i know it's going into it so a lot of my tracks even just start as a breakdown sometimes so which is it, exactly the case with this um it's important actually that you get your drums in quite quickly uh after a sample like this so I would start um, I think I started with some very basic drums that I knew would kind of work with this with that horn line so uh, was it, was it clap? yeah like this uh, so I would start this with just some simple drums and that horns horn line there and just just check that those drums, you know, you're trying to work the drums round the sample essentially, um, rather than just starting from drums from scratch. So yeah, the next thing I would, like, I would do is like, so I'd start with a sample or some music, and then start weaving the drums in pretty pretty quickly after that. Um, but what I would do is generally um, the the start of it would be something like this kind of section here, where it would be. Um, sample just going in into the drop maybe a, a, a breakdown uh, so going straight yeah so maybe just something like this Let's, let's delete that for, for the sake of the uh, video. And like, often I would find, you know, at that point I would start working on the bass, so let me, let me mute the bass. But one thing I find really useful, and I do a lot of my tracks is, yeah, so you'd have like that section, and you'd just have it going into the drums yeah. instrumental. Yeah. Um, but what I find useful is to have like a little stab sometimes as well before. So things like that, this, it's just you're really useful to, I don't know, I just find it like much better than just going straight into the drums. So that, that stab sort of inspires me to write the bass and um, you know, uh, I'll maybe, um, I don't know, Sometimes I find with like, especially with drum and bass, is like, you know, although I like playing the keyboard and stuff and, and, and playing stuff in, with bass it's so like, it's so fiddly that I prefer to do, do it on the key, key group, the key in it. Um, 
So what I'd do is I'd start off with like maybe the tonic tonic note of, of the sample. So, you, you know, you've got the... So you know, you know that, that, that that's like the, the main key of it. And I may just try it an octave up and just go straight, you know, something, or, or maybe like that, you know, like something like this. And then maybe down. And that sort of quickly gets me vibing, and it's, and it's like, um, but without that stab there, or, or the kind of music going before, I don't think I'd write a bass like that with just the drums on its own sort of thing. So, um, you know, and then, you know, that loop, you know. So, you, you know, that, that's one loop, and then you can take that and repeat that, and maybe do an edit on it and do something like, I don't know, maybe invert it so that goes up there and maybe you you know so then you get so you know that makes like a nice um yeah and then you know repeat that and you know, I'm doing it on a full track here. If it was like, you know, um, we were starting from scratch, I'd obviously be just copying and pasting stuff. But, um, but you know, like always kind of doing edits on it. So maybe on this end one, um, we'll do, I don't know, something something different there. Maybe we'll we'll do a pitch bend. Um, Yeah, so there you've got like not that high pitch. That's what I hate about logic. It doesn't <laughs> let's put that back to naught, right? Yeah. Look. So quickly you've got like nice little nice little bass line rolling there. And then and then um I will uh yeah just keep keep copying and co copying and pasting just uh, you know like I always feel like if you're stuck on a track just copy and paste what you've got there and do an edit on the next bit. It seems really like cliche and like you know it's like no it's still not good but like you it's amazing how your brain reacts when you like you're listening to say like 50 seconds of music rather than like a two bar loop it just suddenly starts to feel better because if you think about it music's not always about the impact of something coming or the drop it's how it progresses through the thing you know and um you know you don't get a chance to do that unless you start arranging it um yeah i mean generally like drum and bass is always about like 16 bar um like the you know a, a, a sort of a section, a good section would be a 16 bar section. Um, so, you know, maybe you could have this bass line running for 16 bars here. Um, but then the, ne the next 16 bars, you will maybe want to change it up for something else. Um, uh, that might be, or that might be. <laughs> Yeah, you might you might bring in a might bring in a vocal in there, and, and instead of that being like on the uh, the re sound, you might um, just move it to like uh, a sub or something. You know, just yeah, you, you don't even have to rewrite notes. It's just constantly just changing it and keeping it interesting. And also, what I do a lot of is is at the end of this, generally like my main section of a drum and bass tune, like the main drop is usually going to be about 40, 48 bars. So that's 16 bars of like the main section, another 16 bars of maybe like a vocal coming in or it's changing, and then another 16 bars of it rolling out and doing something else. And of course, like you, you wonder to yourself, well, why, why would you do that? Maybe it would be good to just keep on going up and up. But actually like, you know, I was thinking about this the other day when I was DJing in Manchester the other day, it's like, you know, 
there's a reason why those tracks go out. One, it means that you can then go back and kind of take it back to the breakdown or wherever you're going and go back into the drop. So it's, it has, you know, a lot of dynamics to the track. The other thing is that if you're mixing, generally that's the point where the next mix starts coming in. So you want it to be a little bit stripped out and, and um, you know, it helps, helps it being a bit more DJ friendly. On this tune, um, I think this is the, the radio edit of the track. And uh, so we, we generally like just had 32 bars of the track because, you know, for, for radio edit and streaming, they want, want the edits a, a lot quicker. And so some people complain about like short edits on streaming and stuff, but I always do like an extended mix as well. There's always an extended mix you could do it. But I actually like, um, I actually like doing um, shorter edits as well because I don't know, like like when you're playing it to someone that's maybe not a DJ, it's like, do you ever get the feeling when you're playing someone a track, it's like dragging and it's like, yeah, you know, it's like when I play people this radio edit, it's like a nice snappy version. So I think that's important in this, in this day and age to have both. I mean, it depends what market you're going for, but it, it certainly doesn't uh, hurt to have that. And um, like before, like, you know, a few years ago, I would like, do the extended mix as the main mix and then cut the radio edit or the stream edit down from that. As now I'm doing the stream edit as the main version and then doing the extended mix as an extended mix, which actually is really fun because at the end, the extended, you can just like, you know, have fun with all those bits that, you know, you didn't use in the track, but it's like, oh, that sounds good, you know, and just, you know, make it a bit more like um, dubby at the end and stuff. So yeah, you can have a lot more fun with it.